Welcome to the Joseph Carlson Show. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a couple different subjects. We have a lot of companies in my portfolio, but we have some of the bigger ones, like, for instance, Apple and Microsoft. Well, they're reporting earnings this week. In fact, they're going to report earnings very soon. We're going to be talking about the earnings coming up with a lot of different companies. We have companies like Apple, Microsoft, Visa. We have some specific big holdings in my portfolio that are also reporting earnings. We have Vici, my new real estate holding. They're reporting earnings this week. We have Texas Roadhouse. That's another company I'm very bullish on that they're reporting earnings as well. So we're going to talk about earnings and go over what I think is the biggest challenge for companies this this week when they report earnings this is going to be the very tough thing that they have to overcome and in some cases this challenge is so big it'll make the companies look like they're not performing well when they really are i'll give you a spoiler alert the challenge they're facing is comps it's comparables it's comparables of their earnings this year to last year because of how unique of a year last year was so i'm going to go into the concept of comps And whether that should factor into how we look at these companies, I think it should. So we'll be looking into that and how it's affecting these type of great companies when they have such tough comparables to compare to last year. We're also going to be responding to a little clip here. And this one is just such a tone deaf comment from Jeff Bezos. After his trip to space, they did a press conference, like a debriefing, and he thanks Amazon employees and customers for paying for his trip. So we'll be looking at this later in the show. We also have a reaction. I'm gonna be giving a reaction to a comment that was left on one of my previous episodes that shames me. He says, Joe, as long as you get your dividend, you don't care how irresponsible some of your investments are. Shame on you. So I'm being shamed in the comments section. And what I did was I asked this individual, well, what are these irresponsible investments that I have? Can you guess the companies that he considers to be irresponsible that I hold in my portfolio? Maybe you can. We're going to be looking at them at the end of this episode, and I'll be giving my thoughts overall on the concept of investing in irresponsible companies. So as always, we have a lot to jump into. If you haven't checked out the Patreon by now, I think you're missing out. We have a lot of fun stuff going on there. We have a big Discord community, lots of active members of it, people that do all different styles of investing and have different input. It's a pretty fun place to talk about investing. So you get access to that through the Patreon, as well as exclusive episodes. You get access to Qualtrum.com, which is a dividend tracking portfolio projecting website that gives you lots of information about your portfolio. And we also have it in an iOS app as well. It's on your iPhone now, and we're making constant updates to that. So if you haven't already, try out the Patreon. There's a link in the description of this video. Okay, now let's go ahead and jump into my portfolio and the earnings week that we have ahead of us. We have some big companies reporting earnings. In particular, in my portfolio, we have Apple and Microsoft reporting earnings. These are, well, the the biggest company in the world, and then one of the biggest companies in the world reporting earnings this week early on this week. So we're going to hear how Apple's doing and how Microsoft is doing. We have other companies in my portfolio that are very big, like Vici. This is a small company, but a big holding. So I have $20,000 invested into this company. I'm very bullish on it. It's not a short-term play. So I don't think this is one that you're going to earn a lot of money in a short amount of time. It's just not that type of company, but I'm bullish overall on the fundamentals of this business and the cash flow that it will produce over the long run. Regardless, this company is also reporting earnings this week. We also have the company in my restaurant and delivery category, Texas Roadhouse. This is one that I'm again very bullish on. Even though it trades at a remotely high price, it's not as high priced as some other companies like Domino's and Chipotle. I think it's reasonably priced. It's growing very fast. It has no debt. It has a business model that can be replicated over and over and over again. They're experimenting with different restaurant brands as well that they own. And I just think it's a fantastic company to own right now. So this is a good dividend paying company that also has their earnings report coming up this week. Now, in addition to the companies that I own, we have a lot of different companies reporting their earnings this week. And I think that they're going to face one giant challenge that will be very difficult. And that is the concept of comparables. Comparables is going to be the biggest challenge that these companies face. What are comparables? That's a question you might be asking. What are comparables? I'm not talking about in real estate when you compare the property value of one thing to another. That is a completely separate definition. When I'm talking about comparables, I'm talking about this definition, which is the performance this year compared to the performance last year. 
You see, the problem the companies are facing right now is the earnings report are almost always on a year over year basis. They're year over year. They're not quarter over quarter. They're not decade over decade. They're year over year. And the issue with that is, is that last year was a unique year. So a lot of these companies, especially tech companies like Apple and Microsoft, had unusually good earnings last year. And this has been a challenge because even if they have good earnings this year, it might not look good in comparison. So this is the challenge that these companies face right now. If a company has an unusually good year, the next year, although actually good, maybe by comparison, look bad. So a lot of the companies like Apple and Microsoft that benefited from people staying home and buying so many devices and playing games and being on their services virtually 24 seven, now they have this comparable this year to compare themselves with last year. So they have to beat an unusually good year to even look like they're doing good. When in reality, even if they underperformed last year, on an annualized basis over a longer time period, they're still doing better. So this has by far been the biggest challenge that these type of companies have faced. You see, Netflix is one of the best examples of tough comparables. On the baby blue line, we have 2020. This is how many subscribers they gained in 2020. Netflix gained, I believe, about 40 million subscribers in 2020. That is an unusually good year. You can see that in just a couple months, they gained like 25 million. That's incredible. But obviously we know why. It was COVID, people were locked down, they had nothing else to do other than stay at home and in large part watch Netflix. Well, in this year by comparison, since they're gaining a little bit less subscribers than usual because of the massive pull forward last year, their comparables are tough. This is a tough thing to beat. So by comparison, Netflix looks like its business is struggling. It had such a good year last year that this year it looks like it's struggling when it's really not. It's not struggling as much as people might think. On an annualized return over the past five years, Netflix's subscriber gain is actually right on track. It's completely normal. It's just the comparables that make it look difficult. Gene Munster, who's an analyst that covers these type of companies, talks about the concept of comparables and how it actually reflects on Netflix's business. Uh, you know, I think you really need to think about the business and the stock. The business is doing really well. Paid sub ads up 9%. The guidance was for 9%. Even with that guide down, it still was 9%. This is off some incredibly difficult comps. And so I think give them... He says this is off of some incredibly difficult comps. He's noting how much of an unusually good year Netflix had last year and how even so they're still performing good. But by comparables, it doesn't look good to most investors. Credit also engagement up 17% year over year from the pre-pandemic levels. What that tells me, Melissa, is that more people have gotten uh, essentially hooked on Netflix. It is a testimony of their great content. Jane notes that despite the strong fundamentals of the business, the increased engagement, the growing number of subscribers, the stock price shares a different story. Netflix is suffering from tough comparables and it will be a while until it looks like they are growing at the same pace that they once were. Now, of course, Netflix is not the only company that has to deal with this issue of very tough comparables from this year to last year. Apple's another company that had blowout earnings as a result of, well, being on lockdown, having COVID and everybody being in their houses using digital products and being on their phones. Naturally, that led to a lot of Apple customers using more of their services, their games, you know, Apple Music, Apple Arcade, Apple TV Plus, all the different products that Apple sells, more people reliant on them. Not only digital products, but also their hardware. People got iPads to communicate with family and laptops to do more work from home type of stuff. It led to a blowout sales a 54% increase in Apple, and they authorized $90 billion in share buybacks. This was about as good of an earnings report as I've ever seen with a company ever. There was even analysts that covered lots of big tech companies, and they said that this was hands down the best earnings report they've ever seen from any company ever. Now, after an earnings report like that, you'd suspect the stock to go rocketing to the moon, right? That's what you'd think would happen. That's not what happened with Apple. In fact, the stock price trended downwards, six or 7%. How could it possibly trend downwards after that good of an earnings report? It started eventually to trend back upwards. It's up around 10% since then, but that's over the course of the past few months. So why hasn't Apple rocketed to the moon in price after that earnings report? It's the same thing we're all concerned about. They're setting themselves up for tough comparables. 
So I hold Apple in my portfolio as well as Microsoft. Both of these companies have this issue that they're going to face, and I'm gonna to continue to hold both of them through this earnings report, even though they've recently gone up in price, and in some cases, quite a bit. Microsoft has performed very well. I'm up $4,300 on this company, and then Apple obviously has performed okay. I'm up $14,000 on this one. So the reason that I plan on holding these companies even when they face tough comparables and there is some risk in the short term with their earnings report is because I'm looking at the overall picture. Here's the revenue segment of Apple. This is year over year. Since 2009, they earned 42 billion in revenue. Then they grew that to 65 billion, 108 billion, 156 billion, so on and so forth to a company that now earns 274 billion last year. It's a lot of money that they're taking in in revenue. The growth has slowed a little bit since 2009, as most mature companies do, but there's still a lot of growth going on with this company. If we go in and highlight just the services portion of Apple's business, which is the high margin, residual income, subscription income stuff like the Apple Arcade, Apple Music, Apple Fitness, Apple TV+, Plus, uh, their insurances, and the App Store, you can see the growth of this specifically over time. Look how quickly this is growing. The growth of their Apple services is not slowing down, and every new device that they sell is another opportunity to entrench someone into their monthly services. This also has the benefit of being almost double the margins, the operating margins on the service revenue than their normal device sales. So they're making 60 or 70% margins on the service business. Last year in revenue of their services, Apple brought in $53.7 billion. It's a lot of money being brought in by services. I'm gonna be paying attention to Apple's business in terms of its growth, its service business, and how the story's playing out, but I'm not gonna base whether I buy or sell this stock off of one quarter and if there's some pulled forward demand from last year to this year, because I do think the comparables are tough. If the earnings report isn't as blowout as usual, that's not something that concerns me with Apple. So right now, I'm not concerned. I actually think that Apple and Microsoft's earnings will be very good. I think that Vici's will be good as well, but I'll give a follow-up video later this week giving my reaction to what the actual numbers are. Now, moving on from that, I have to highlight this clip. This is something I did not expect. I consider Jeff Bezos to be very smart, very intelligent. Obviously, he started Amazon. You can't be a dummy and do that. You have to have a decent level of skill to be able to start a company like Amazon, run it for 20 plus years like he did and grow it to one of the biggest companies in the world. But I have to say, fair is fair. I have to give criticism where it's deserved. And this is perhaps one of the most tone deaf comments I think I've ever heard an executive say. It might rival the, the Blizzard con where they're trying to sell to their core gaming audience, mobile Diablo and, and mobile games, right? This is on par with a CEO being as tone deaf. This is one of the most tone deaf, if not the most tone deaf comment I've ever seen. I also, I wanna thank uh, every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer, because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> so seriously, for every Amazon customer out there and every Amazon employee, thank you from the bottom of my heart very much. Uh, it's very appreciated. I wanna thank every Amazon employee and Amazon customer for paying for my vacation to space, my obscenely expensive vacation to space. Thank you for paying for that and footing the bill for it. That's not really the best message to be sending to your employees and customers. I'm sure there's a lot of warehouse workers working a thankless job that pays $15 an hour and endless hours and what I would consider to be not fun work, working in a warehouse, shipping off package after package, going through routine over and over again, and they're watching this going, you're welcome, Jeff. I'm glad I could help you fund this, this vacation to space. Now, I'm no PR specialist, but I think I can say pretty definitively that this was the wrong thing to say. This was the wrong message to send out. Now, one of the users on Twitter responded to this little clip and said, I work full time at Amazon and still can't afford to live alone while renting out one of the cheapest apartments in my area. But hey, at least he can afford a $500 million yacht and a trip to space. At least he's admitted that he's not the one that worked for it. Now, normally I'm not the one that finds myself defending entitled millennials complaining about wealthy people on Twitter, but that's what I find myself doing today. With Jeff Bezos' comments, I think these type of responses are warranted. He's basically saying, thank you for paying for this. And they're saying, we didn't want to pay for this. So big oof for Jeff Bezos there. 
I think that this type of clip of him thanking his workers for paying for his trip to space is going to be something that is often quoted and played for people that want to have wealth redistribution. Now, moving on from that, I want to go ahead and address this comment that was left on the previous video. This was from the user RTR. And for the record, I might bring back the email responses. So if you want to send me a question for the show, the email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. And I'll respond to any emails I get that I think are interesting and other people can learn something from. So if you have any questions, criticisms, comments, email me at joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. Now let's go ahead and look at this one that was a comment left by user on my previous video. This is from RTR. He says, talk about shaming. Joe, as long as you get your dividend, you don't care how irresponsible some of your investments are. Shame on you. Now, I inevitably do something that offends someone in every episode of this show. We've done 170 of them. And since the very beginning, there's always been a group of people that are offended by almost anything that I do. But I always find it intriguing. So I said, could you be more specific with your criticism? He says, sure. For censorship, that equals Google, Apple, and Facebook. So Google, Apple, and Facebook are censorship. Then he says, monopoly squashing business equal Amazon, Apple, Then he says sweatshops equal Apple, Nike. He says you worship Buffett, but most of his businesses are socially irresponsible. Coke and Pepsi, those are worse than COVID-19. I know people addicted to that stuff, but at least you can retire with a clean conscience, right? So he's basically saying that I'm invested in all of these evil companies. I worship Buffett and I can't retire with a clean conscience. Now, my reply to you, RTR, might surprise you. I do agree with you to some extent here. I think that some of the things you're bringing up are accurate. You say that Google, Apple, and Facebook, they practice censorship. I most certainly agree. I think that in some cases they do censorship and they do it unfairly. They they kick the president off their platform for violating various reasons. They censored uh, Hunter Biden stories. They censor various news articles. Sometimes it leans to certain political sides and there's arguments to be made there that these companies practice a level of censorship. I also agree that these companies are monopolies. They squash businesses frequently. You can look at Amazon and diapers.com. They crush that business with strong arm tactics. And Apple has done the same thing throughout its life, crushing businesses left and right, dominating them iteratively over and over again. So I agree with you there as well. Now with the sweatshops you name Apple and Nike, I don't know as much about that issue, but I hear that the work environment for their employees overseas creating their products is not great. You say you worship Warren Buffett, but most of his businesses are socially irresponsible. I wouldn't use the term worship. I don't say prayers to Warren Buffett, but I do consider him a great investor, along with Peter Lynch and Howard Marks and other people that I try to learn from. You say that he has socially irresponsible investments, i.e. Coke and Pepsi, and that they're worse than COVID-19. Now, I think that's a little bit of a stretch there. Coke and Pepsi are not spreading around the world, killing people indiscriminately like COVID-19. So I think you've you've stretched a little bit on that comparison. I can't follow you there. You say, I know people that are addicted to that stuff, but at least when you'll retire, you'll retire with a clean conscience. So I actually overall agree with you, RTR. These companies aren't perfect. They do have problems. Apple and Facebook and Google and Nike, they all have things that they can improve. But my question for you specifically, RTR, if you want to give us an answer to this, just leave a comment in this video, is what are you invested in? What are you invested in? Very simple. If you're invested in real estate, do you like the fact that someone else has to go and work to pay you while you get wealthy? Do you think that's moral? There's no problem with someone else going to work, coming back and paying you while you're the owner, getting rich off of the land and the rent. There's moral arguments to be made against real estate. Are you invested in land? You have Henry George pointing out philosophical arguments against even owning land, saying landlords grow rich in their sleep without working, risking, or economizing. So there's people strongly against real estate and land. Are you invested in oil? Because if so, you're killing planet Earth, polluting the skies, right? We've all heard that argument. Are you invested in gold? What could be wrong with gold? Well, blood has been spilt over gold. Wars have been fought over it. Do you like owning that asset, right, with that context? Do you like investing in Bitcoin? Maybe that's a a new one, right? There's no issues with Bitcoin. Oh, there's the big argument that Bitcoin is polluting the skies because of the amount of energy it takes to run Bitcoin. 
We can go across any investment, left, right, and center, and inevitably there'll be people that have an issue with that investment. I've seen it with my portfolio. It doesn't seem to matter what I invest in, there's inevitably someone like yourself that has an issue with it. Now there actually are some industries and companies that I've avoided so far, RTR, actual ones that I don't think that are good for the planet or people generally speaking. I avoid MLM companies. I just don't like them. I wish that type of marketing would go away, so I avoid them. I don't invest in tobacco. I, I think that it's not a good product. In any dosage, I think it's a bad product, so I don't invest in the company. I don't invest in private prisons. I don't think there should be any kind of profit motive behind a prison, so I don't invest in it. So there are different categories I ignore or I don't invest in, but it's not my job to go and tell people where their moral set should be. I show what I invest in, I show what I'm trying to do to make money, and it's up to your own judgment what you want to invest in. But I'd be interested to know, RTR, what are the very moral and responsible businesses that you invest in that never squash other businesses, that never cause any type of adverse effect whatsoever, that they're above criticism? I'd like you to leave a list of good quality companies that fit that description, and I'd genuinely be interested in looking over them. But with that said, that is all for this episode. I'll see you all next time.